Hello, followers of Neuro Takeaway. Today we have the privilege to receive in the channel an outstanding pathologist, maybe the most influential one in our times regarding brain tumors, Professor David Lewis. David Lewis is professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School. He is the pathologist in chief at Massachusetts General Hospital. His lab was the first uh, that um, demonstrate the, that molecular uh, approaches could be used to subclassify uh, malignant gliomas and they also could be used to predict the response of malignant gliomas to a specific treatments. He co-chaired and was the primary editor of the last few classifications, the WHO classifications of CNS tumors and he is actually the, a member of the expert panel for the classification of 2021, which is, uh, will be released uh, later on this year. Uh, Professor David Lewis is also interested in medical history. He has published some articles on the issue and a book about the history of the um, mass general pathology services. So without further ado, let's go to the interview. Hi, David, how are you doing? Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Fine, thank you. I'm honored to be invited to chat with you today. Okay, well, I have, uh, I, I, I wonder if you have any general uh, introductory comments uh, about uh, brain tumors classification in general, uh, being one of the individuals that had guided the last uh, few classifications of WHO about CNS tumors. Yes, a few general comments about tumor classifications. We as clinicians tend to think about tumor classifications in terms of how classifying affects the care of individual patients, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy. But it's important to realize that when you set up international classifications, these are relevant beyond the individual patient and individual oncologist treating that patient. For example, proper classifications affect clinical trials and how the results of those clinical trials are interpreted. If there's, in, if there's incorrect classification, the entire interpretation of a clinical trial could be wrong. If you then step back a little further, you realize that proper classification also affects how experimental studies are interpreted, whether it be mouse models or experimenting with tumor cells in petri dishes. If you have the wrong tumor classification, you can make a completely incorrect assumption about the results of that, and that may in turn affect subsequent clinical trials that are based on such experimental results. If you step back even further, you realize that classification is also essential for epidemiological studies. These are large scale studies that are trying to look at associations between particular diseases, particular tumor types, and uh, etiological reasons why those uh, tumors develop. Furthermore, if you step back even, even farther, you realize that proper classification influences how governments and insurers decide which diseases need to be funded for further research and for preferential funding for therapies. And so when setting these classifications, one has to be sensitive that while the primary effect is on individual patients and how they are treated, there are many effects that uh, go beyond that towards clinical, and basic science experiments, as well as epidemiological studies and government approaches. Yes, it's an enormous responsibility. Um, 
I, I have a question about the likely reception of this classification, especially on the pathology community uh, and, and some changes that are taking place in, in pathology diagnostics. But uh, uh, how do you think the, the pathology community will receive this new classification, especially taking into consideration that it will further advance with molecular technology? And I, I don't know if they may think that this can weaken the classical pathology. Yeah, it's a good question. So firstly, let me say that the extent of the changes for 2021 will not be as conceptually large as the changes were for 2016. 2016 was really a ground shifting in terms of the introduction of molecular parameters into the classification. Yeah. 2021 does not conceptually change that, but it makes some further advances on the diagnosis of specific tumors by advancing the role of molecular diagnostics. So I actually think that the effects of the 2021 changes will be less disruptive than the 2016 changes were. Now, the major molecular change that appears in 2021 that was not in 2016 relates to methylome profiling. This is the use of arrays that use the methylation characteristics of genes across the whole genome to characterize tumors. It's a broad technique, and it has clearly been shown to be very powerful when used in the hands of a small group of institutions around the world. But the classification is a World Health Organization classification, and we can't simply endorse technologies that are not widely available around the world. Right. So in, in the 2021 classification, we have mentioned in multiple places the power of methylome profiling, but have tried to come up with ways to diagnose the tumors that don't necessitate methylome profiling. That being said, there are one or two entities, maybe a few, a few more, but just a few entities for which the diagnosis requires methylome profiling, but most of these are quite rare or they are subtypes of lesions that can be diagnosed using other approaches. Mm -hmm. in, in general, the methylome profiling can be used to diagnose, it's probably 80 to 90% of all tumors can be diagnosed with it, but for the remaining, 10 to 20 percent, it doesn't help much at all, and you still need the traditional approaches. Mm -hmm. So a pathologist in most areas of the world picking up the 2021 yeah. shouldn't be too alarmed by the changes at a conceptual level. And is, regarding molecular biology, uh, do you think it, it's a, a branch of pathology or it's another another area, another field. So Carlos, you raise a very interesting question, which is perhaps one of the most important things I can say on this interview, which is to offer a definition of what pathologists do. There's a misconception in many places that the pathologist's role is linked to a microscope. That, however, is a historical interpretation based on an instrument that the pathologist happens to use at the present time. But if you look back about 100 years, there was a great debate as to the utility of the microscope for doing cancer diagnosis. And there were many people who felt that it was either way too fancy and modern or that it offered no help whatsoever. 
And there are astounding parallels, if you look back 100 years, over the debate at the utility of the microscope with the kinds of debates we hear now about the use of molecular technologies for tumor classification. So my definition of what pathologists do is fairly simple. We take specimens, and most of us work on humans, but there are, there are veterinary pathologists as well. But most of us take human specimens, and we extract data from those specimens. And then we interpret and present those data in ways that help a patient-facing clinician to guide the care of a patient. Now you'll notice in that definition, there was no discussion of a microscope. There was no discussion of a PCR machine. There was no discussion of a blood analyzer. The technologies come and go. They're technologies we no longer use now that we used 30 years ago. And in 30 years time, there'll be technologies that we use that we don't even know about today. The pathologist's job is to adapt to those changes. And so as molecular pathology has come along, the pathologist's job is to adapt. And if the microscope goes away entirely, which I don't think it will in the near future, the pathologist's job will be simply to adapt. And there are numerous examples over the past 100 years of this happening in the clinical laboratories. So when you ask, is molecular biology a part of pathology? I would argue yes, as long as it provides a mechanism of extracting data from human specimens in order to guide patient care. It's a really good definition, David. Um, now I would like to ask you some questions, uh, specific questions about the 2021 classification. Uh, the first one is, is quite trivial, but I wonder why changing Roman numerals for Arabic numbers? <laughs> um, yeah, two, two, uh, two perhaps trivial answers. The first is that uh, the gentleman who is editing the fifth edition of all of the WHO classifications um, would like to make the different organ system classifications as uniform as possible. The CNS WHO was the only one in the past that used Roman numerals. All of the other WHO classifications use Arabic numerals. Mm. So one reason is to make the CNS classification conform with the others in the fifth edition. Now I should say that the reason the CNS classification in the past used a different numeral system was to actually emphasize the differences between the way the CNS group thought about grading versus the way other organ system groups thought about grading. So I'll illustrate what I mean for you. As you well know, if you have a diffuse astrocytic tumor, we think of them as grades two, three, and four. When we have a medulloblastoma, we think of it as grade four. We don't think about a grade one medulloblastoma or a grade one glioblastoma. But in other organ systems, they take the diagnosis and then they apply a grading system that begins with one and often goes to two and three. So you have a malignancy in another area of the body and if it's a low-grade malignancy, it can be grade one. But in the CNS, a grade one implies that it's a benign, a biologically benign tumor. So the CNS grading system in the past was a clinical and biological grading system. It was not a strictly pathological grading system. Now that alone has produced uh, challenges for us because even when we've shifted to using the Arabic numerals, 
we are using the same correlate. So for the diffuse astrocytic tumors, it's two, three, and four. Yeah. So that's one reason is to make it conform with the way the rest of the body systems do their WHO grading. The second reason is very important as well, uh, albeit a little bit trivial, as you say, uh, and that is that there's less chance of making a mistake or a typographical error with Arabic numerals versus Roman. So let's take the situation of a diffuse astrocytoma. If you grade that and don't use the terms anaplastic or glioblastoma, but you always call it an astrocytoma, the only distinction is the grade. So you could have a grade two IDH mutant astrocytoma or a grade three IDH mutant astrocytoma. And because the only difference in Roman numerals is a single extra slash, <laughs> it seemed too risky. Okay, yeah. And so it's a little bit of a safety change that we've made when we've shifted to what we call grading within types. Good point. Yeah, I understand. What, what will be the difference between a grade 4 astrocytoma and a GBM in this classification? So as you recall, in 2016, we introduced the notion that there are IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic tumors and IDH wild type ones. Yeah. It's become even more clear over the past five years that these are really different beasts. These are entirely different biological entities. And so we wanted to do something that would distinguish them more. So what we are essentially restricting the term glioblastoma now is to an IDH wild type tumor. And if it's IDH mutant, we want people to use the term diffuse astrocytoma or IDH mutant astrocytoma. Now, that creates an interesting set of scenarios because you can have two tumors that look the same under the microscope. So let's take two tumors that every neuropathologist looking under the microscope would say, this is a glioblastoma by the way I was trained. It has microvascular proliferation, it has necrosis, it's a diffuse astrocytic tumor. And yet, if it's IDH wild type in 2021's classification, we would call that glioblastoma IDH wild type. On the other hand, if it's IDH mutant in the 2021 classification, we would call that diffuse astrocytoma, comma, IDH mutant, comma, WHO CNS grade four. No glioblastoma. So we wouldn't use the term glioblastoma in the setting of an IDH mutant tumor. What that further allows is to emphasize the similarity between all of the IDH mutant diffuse astrocytomas, the grade twos, the grade threes, and the grade fours. So that's one key difference in the setting of a tumor that looks under the microscope like a glioblastoma. Whether it's IDH mutant or IDH wild type will affect the name of that tumor. Now, there are also some differences that have been brought about by the introduction of molecular testing. Um, and we can go into those if you're interested as well. Yeah, yes. So, uh, w w one of the nice things that I've been saying to people when I've been talking to them about the 2021 classification, 
is that if you've been following the C Impact Now updates, you already know 90 plus percent of what's going to be in the 2021 classification, because for the most part, we followed all of the recommendations of C Impact Now. You stress the importance of um, necrosis and microvascular proliferation, but what, what would be the role of uh, mitotic activity and, and nuclear atypia uh, in the next classification? So let's, um, let's talk about that question in two contexts. One is in the context of IDH mutant, and one is in the context of IDH wild type. Okay. Let's discuss them separately. Okay. So in the context of IDH mutation, you've got a diffuse astrocytic glioma and it's IDH mutant. If you start seeing mitotic activity, more than just occasional mitoses, that becomes a grade three. Okay? Okay. Just like the way we do it now. Yeah. If you see microvascular proliferation or necrosis, that becomes a grade four, just like we do it now. But there's one addition, and that's CDKN2AB, or P16, homozygous deletion. Mm. If you find CDKN2AB, homozygous deletion, even if it's grade three or grade two, very rare in grade two, but, but if you find it, then it's a grade four tumor. So that's very interesting, Carlos, if you think about it, because that says the pathologist looks under the microscope and sees a grade three histology, but it's got a molecular finding of the CDKN2AB homozygous deletion. That pathologist then assigns a WHO CNS grade of four. So in that sense, grading is not only histological as it has been until now, it's histological and or molecular. That's a change, eh? big change. That's a change, yep. So let's take the IDH wild type situation. In most, in most cases, um, IDH wild type diffuse astrocytomas look like glioblastomas or they are some other kind of tumor that shouldn't be called a diffuse astrocytoma. So let me repeat that. Most tumors that are IDH wild type, yeah. if they don't look like a glioblastoma, they often will be other tumors and you need to make sure that they're not some other form of a neoplasm. <laughs> okay. 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 But if you're convinced that they are a diffuse astrocytic tumor in an adult and they don't meet criteria for glioblastoma, they don't have microvascular proliferation, they don't have necrosis, traditionally we would have called those grade two or grade three. Yeah. In those situations, the recommendation now is that you look for a set of molecular alterations, EGFR gene amplification, TERT promoter mutation, or gain, combined gain of uh, chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10, what's called plus 7 minus 10. And if you find any one of those three molecular changes, you call it glioblastoma by the 2021 classification. And if, so we, me, if we don't find any of them, how would we call it? So let, let me come back to that question in two minutes. Okay. But let me, re, let me repeat what I just said because it's, it's very important. Yeah. If you have a grade two or grade three appearing diffuse astrocytic tumor, not an oligo, diffuse astrocytic tumor in an adult, and you find any one of those three molecular alterations, that is now going to be called a glioblastoma. If it's IDH wild type, I should emphasize IDH wild type. So 
both the IDH mutant and the IDH wild type situations have a few molecular parameters that change the grade if you find it. So this is interesting because remember earlier I told you, you can have two tumors that look like a glioblastoma, but one of them might not be called a glioblastoma. It might be called a grade four astrocytoma. In the situation that I'm talking about now, you can have a tumor that looks like a grade two or a grade three, but it actually might be called a glioblastoma. So let's say again, just to repeat, because it's complicated. Yeah. You've got a grade two or a grade three IDH wild type astrocytoma that's diffuse, and you find EGFR gene amplification, that is going to be called a glioblastoma. C-Impact now said to call it a diffuse astrocytic neoplasm or glioma with molecular features of glioblastoma. And we're suggesting that's too complicated. Let's just call it glioblastoma. Okay. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But is there the possibility that there is no uh, molecular alterations in a, in a wild type? Yes, yes. So uh, that was the question that I promised you I would get back to in two minutes. And the answer there is that we strongly encourage the use of what are called integrated and layered diagnoses for the reporting of CNS neoplasms. We feel it's important to state what the histology is, what the molecular findings are. If when you put that together, it doesn't come up to a WHO diagnosis, in other words, you look over the chart and you don't find anything, you use the term NEC, which means not elsewhere classified. So let's take the situation that you asked about. You've got a grade three diffuse astrocytoma, and you do all of those tests I told you about. Yeah. EGFR, TERT promoter mutation, plus 10, I'm uh, sorry, plus seven minus 10. Yeah. You do, you do all of those and you don't find any of them. And you go to the WHO classification and you say, oh my, there's nothing here that says grade three astrocytoma, IDH wild type. It doesn't appear. At that point, you can make a diagnosis that describes your findings. So in that situation, you might say diffuse astrocytic glioma, IDH wild type, but without A, B, and C. And then you say NEC, not elsewhere classified. And when the oncologist sees that, the oncologist should realize this is an unusual tumor. Yeah. It, it's not the kind you automatically say, this is how I should treat it, okay? So, so the use of that term, NEC, is a red flag. And it says, we've done as much as we can possibly do based on current knowledge to understand this tumor, but we simply don't have enough information to give it a specific diagnosis. Okay, I understand. But there's one other situation to emphasize also. We, we just talked about NEC, which is not elsewhere classified. But there's also NOS, which says um, not otherwise specified, okay? And that's a term also that raises a red flag, but that means something quite different. It means you didn't have the ability to do all of those tests. Now, that may be that your lab can't do it, or it may be that your lab tried, but the tissue was not good enough. But the NOS diagnosis says to a place who might be seeing that, um, seeing that patient next, or to your oncologist at your institution, that it may be a WHO diagnosis, but it needs further workup if possible. And so we really strongly encourage the use of NEC and NOS. Mm 
the result is that there are fewer entities listed in some of the categories in the 2021 classification compared with 2016. But the entities that are there are much more tightly defined. So I, I let me, let me say, uh, if I understood you, if I have a wild type, I have uh, the possibility of glioblastoma, GBM, if I have the mutations, but there is no possibility of type two or type three. Not according to the World Health Organization, no. But if you use a layered diagnosis, um, you can list all of the features that you find, and the oncologist can look at it and say, okay, I understand what it is. Even though it doesn't fit exactly in, I understand exactly what it is. Okay. And I should say that um, in, in the situation you just brought up, if it's IDH wild type, and it has microvascular proliferation or necrosis, but you can't do any of the molecular tests, then it's a glioblastoma anyway. Okay, okay. And most, most of the time, you know from your, or from radiology practices in general, most of the time in adults when you have these IDH wild type tumors uh, that are diffuse astrocytomas, almost, almost the, over the vast majority of the time, they are glioblastomas histologically. That's right. I have a, a, a moving to another issues, three short questions. One is why isn't there a grade four oligodendroglioma? So historically, there was not a grade four because, as I mentioned earlier, the way CNS applied WHO grading, it was roughly proportional to the prognosis. And it was always felt that if you had an oligo, even if it was a grade three oligo, it never did as badly or very rarely did as badly as a true grade four glioblastoma did. And so uh, it, it was felt that you didn't need to go up to grade four. Okay, I understand. It's, it's the same answer why there's no grade one. Because if grade one implies that you can take it out and surgically cure it, that's impossible for an oligodendroglioma. Okay, another question is about pilocytic astrocytoma. Is, uh, can it be malignant, a pilocytic astrocytoma? Still a, 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 a quite a debatable subject in the field. Uh, I think all of us have seen examples that look like pilocytic astrocytomas that have very worrisome histological features. But in the reports in the literature, those don't always act in a malignant fashion. And I think similarly, we've seen cases that histologically don't look so bad, but that can act badly. And so there really hasn't been a consensus yet as to what the criteria are to define malignancy in a pilocytic astrocytoma. Now, there is a new entity that has been introduced into the 2021 classification which is called high-grade astrocytoma with pyloid features. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and uh, quite a bit of controversy as to whether that should be introduced, but it was felt that, especially based on methylome profiling, there was evidence that it was an entity. So it's, it's introduced in there with a whole bunch of caveats as to what it is. The histology can vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, these tend to be tumors uh, of the posterior fossa in middle-aged patients. Uh, personally, I've only seen one of them. Uh, they have char some characteristic molecular features besides the methylome characteristics. So I think over the next few years, we'll see more reports of these high-grade astrocytomas with pyloid features, and we'll begin to get a better idea of what they actually are. But my, the, guess, my guess is that the things that were called malignant pilocytics in the past yes. may fit in with this new entity. But this entity have 
um, has a BRAF mutation. Yeah. It, it can have MAP kinase pathway alterations, yes. Okay, okay. And, and another question has to do with uh, a personal question about glomatosis cerebri. I know that it was removal from the 2016 classification, but it was a very good uh, concept for us as neuroradiologists. Why did you, why did you remove it? So we, we didn't remove it. We put it into the different categories that it fit as what we call a pattern. So if you look in the 2016 under diffuse astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma, you'll find references to the gliomatosis cerebri pattern in those sections. But uh, at a molecular level, the feeling was that it, it's just a very diffusely infiltrating form of those uh, diffuse tumors. But at a molecular level, it's not really inherently biologically different. You know, we, um, we as pathologists could not make the diagnosis except at autopsy. We would have to rely on your guidance as a radiologist to tell us that this was uh, throughout many areas of the brain. But we regard it as a pattern rather than as a distinct biological entity. So we can still use the, the term from uh, an imaging point of view. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, David, let the last part of the interview, I would like to, to know your perspective uh, of the future of pathology and maybe of radiology. Uh, I have a, a, a personal question first. How often do you use your gut feeling to diagnose a brain tumor? <laughs> one, of, one of the good things about introducing molecular diagnosis is that it decreases the subjectivity of what pathologists do. So what I mean by that is if we went back, let's say 15 to 20 years ago, after it was clear that some oligodendrogliomas responded quite well to chemotherapy, many pathologists expanded their definition of what an oligodendroglioma was. And you saw in some centers, the number of diagnoses of oligo went up. And the pathologist said something like, well, I want the patient to have the advantage of chemotherapy. I don't want to miss the diagnosis. And you saw other centers that stuck with what their criteria were. And so if I had a question about a case, I could decide I want to send it to Dr. X because he always calls it oligodendroglioma. <laughs> or I want to send it to Dr. Y because he never calls it oligodendroglioma. It was pretty predictable. But once you introduced IDH and 1P19Q as molecular parameters, it became much more uniform. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, the hope is that we pathologists use our gut feelings less often after the advent of molecular diagnosis than we did in the past. But that being said, I get asked to look at cases every day where somebody wants an opinion and the molecular doesn't solve it all. And this is experience, right? You get more experience looking at cases and understanding how those patients do. But it's been said that um, wisdom is based on uh, people's experience, but that people's experience comes from making mistakes, <laughs> right? And so uh, as each of us matures in our clinical abilities, our clinical experience, we are at a stage where we're still presumably making some mistakes. So yes, I think there is an art form to interpreting cases from a pathology point of view. But the hope is that the subjectivity will go down. But at the end of it, yes, we are humans that are making our best, most informed uh, opinions about very complicated biological processes.
That's good. Uh, which discipline do you think will disappear or will be replaced first by artificial intelligence, pathology or radiology? So Carlos, I'm going to come back to the thing I said earlier. Um, I will say it about pathology, but I, I think it probably applies in radiology too. I don't see a new technology replacing what a pathologist does. I see it being a new technology that a pathologist has to learn to use to do his or her job. So let me repeat that. Artificial intelligence is a technology that pathologists have to use, have to learn how to use to help them do their jobs. It's and, I think, and I think that's true for radiology too. If you don't take that attitude, you're right, you will be replaced. I agree. Now, again, if you look back at the experience of the introduction of the microscope, there was a question at the time, uh, should pathologists do this or should surgeons do this? Most surgical, inter most interpretation of surgical biopsies was done in surgery departments. The pathologists did autopsies and microbiology. They didn't interpret surgical specimens. There was, there was a question at the time, who should do the microscopy of surgery? Should it be surgeons or pathologists? And I, I won't go into the details, but there's a, there are interesting stories. And eventually pathologists, and I'll give credit to some at the Mayo Clinic who, who really took a charge, the lead in doing this. They claimed it for pathology and uh, rapidly developed it as a discipline within the field of pathology. So the challenge and the opportunity for pathologists right now is to claim the use of these computational approaches like AI and use them in pathology. Now, this is the basis of what we've termed computational pathology. And for anyone interested, I'd be glad to talk to them for a long amount of time about the power of computational pathology. But I'll, I'll just give you a simple explanation. Please. Um, you can take the data from uh, CBCs, complete blood counts, which the doctor looks at all the time and says, this is how many white blood cells you have. This is how many red blood cells. This is the size of your red blood cells. You can take that data and get the raw data out of the machines that do that and set up all sorts of mathematical models that can do amazing things with that data. For instance, it can help you diagnose heart attacks more quickly. It can help you diagnose anemias more quickly, sometimes months in advance. It can help you manage diabetes more effectively. So there is a wealth of information sitting in our systems that we have not done enough to analyze. The same is true in radiology. You have all of those beautiful images and they're all in electronic form. And now people have to go and figure out how can you use computational methods to analyze those data. So don't think about them as images. Think about them as the raw data that your MRI or CT machines use to generate through all of the analyses, those pictures that you look at and say, this is a brain. There's the basal ganglia. Don't think about it that way. Think about it as raw data for which all sorts of other things can be done. And when you ask about radiology versus pathology, the major difference is that radiology switched to digital a few decades ago yeah. in most areas of the world. Pathology is digital for some of the things that it does, but still for the glass slides that we use on our microscopes, they're still analog, they're still just analog images. So the big challenge in pathology is how do we do what you did decades ago and convert to digital? 
And as opposed to radiology, where you got rid of all of the processing and all of the film, all of those costs, we still have to generate a slide before we digitize it. And so it's harder economically to understand how pathology departments will switch to digitalization versus how it was relatively easy and cost effectively for radiology departments to do that. So in answer to your question, I think the impact of AI will be greater sooner in radiology than it will be in pathology because so much of what you have is digital already. Yeah. But I don't think it should replace radiologists or pathologists in either subspecialty. Very, very interesting and challenging. I would like to ask you, uh, what tips would you give to a young colleague who wants to become a neuropathologist? So I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic about the field of pathology in general. Part of that, it's my job to be optimistic about it, leading a large pathology department. But part of it is that I'm excited by the changes in technology. As I said, I don't view the role of the pathologist as linked to a specific technology. And there's so much going on at a molecular level, at a computational level, that our field is going to be blessed over the next few decades with many novel ways to extract data from tissue. So what I advise young pathologists is not to be wedded to particular technologies, but to be oriented around disease systems. It doesn't matter whether you are interested in neurological diseases or hematological diseases or gynecological diseases. The idea is that you're expert in a set of diseases and no matter what technologies come along, you will be able to apply those to help the patient-facing physicians manage their patients. As there get to be more technologies and more complicated technologies, the patient-facing physicians will get less comfortable interpreting their own laboratory data. <laughs> And so I actually think there's going to be more of a role for pathologists to interpret those data in the future. So I think it's a great time to go into neuropathology or a great time to go into hematopathology or gynecological pathology or any subdiscipline of the field. Well, David, I don't want to take up more of your precious time. I think it was a very interesting interview because of your answers were great. Uh, and I, I want to thank you again for your kindness. Thank you. I look forward to meeting in person rather than virtually in the future. Of course. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>